As we round the bend past the primaries and head full speed into the midterms, what better time is there for a little reminder about how much is at stake and Frontline is yet again delivering. We we'll look back at how we ended up with the Capitol insurrection, focused on how leading Republicans occasionally challenged Trump, but ultimately determined that they just couldn't quit him. Kevin McCarthy makes a political decision, which is betting on the fact that President Trump will continue to have a hold over the base and the party. We see Lindsey Graham trying to get back in Trump's good graces. And I think that that's symbolic of what's happened to the Republican Party. The, the thing that drives 99% uh, of the folks in politics is self-preservation. You know, to make noise uh, might not be good in terms of my own political interests, therefore I'll stay quiet. I heard from a specific senator who said, Mitch has told us to stay quiet against the president in this period. And I think that led to a lot of what otherwise would be kind of influential senators, at least countering the voice of uh, Donald Trump being silent. And silence is complicity. That complicity and the path it carved toward insurrection is one of the focuses of Frontline's Lies, Politics, and Democracy, which premieres tonight. Director Michael Kirk joins me. Michael, congratulations yet again. Good to see you. Thanks, Jim. Good to see you, too. You know, people may think on the surface this is a story of Donald Trump and his serial lying, but I, I think what I said there is true. It really is a story about the complicity and cowardice among his fellow Republicans, particularly leaders of the Republican Party, is it not? Yes, I think it's a film that's in many ways more about the Republican Party and, and its leaders than uh, Donald Trump. It's, uh, we've been gathering string on this for six years while we watched the Trump administration. We made, uh, as you probably know, because we've talked about him, 15 films about the Trump administration. And all, all along, we kept watching the Republican leadership jockey for what to do. Do we manipulate him? Can he manipulate us? And all the things we've seen, the empowering and the enabling and all of it as they made their um, deal with the devil, if you'll excuse the expression. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and this, and now, right before the midterms, right before really Trump announces what to do in 2024, we thought we'd better lay out what happened with the leadership of the Republican Party and where the party stands at this moment in relation to, uh, to the American democracy. You know, there's so many examples. It's not just uh, the McConnells of the world, the McCarthys. Uh, Ted Cruz, I'm sure people remember, and you recount this in your film, candidate Trump essentially suggested his wife was ugly and that his father, meaning Cruz's father, was involved in the assassination of JFK. So Cruz, at least for a short period of time, in a tough setting at the Republican nominating convention, did stand strong. Here's a little bit about that. It took days for Cruz to decide. He tells them his decision that he's not going to endorse Donald Trump in his speech. And they ask him why. And Cruz looks at them and he says, history isn't kind to the man who holds Mussolini's jacket. He was receiving lots of advice, imploring advice, saying to him in effect, Ted, this is bad for the party, it's bad for Trump, but it's also really bad for you and for your future if you don't get on board the Trump train. Eventually, he and virtually everybody else, except maybe Kinziger and Cheney, did get on the Trump train. Why? Why does every single one of them decide, after a moment of courage, that Trump is the ticket for them? Somebody told me the definition of a politician is somebody who wants to be reelected. That is, that if you if you're a politician, you'll do whatever is necessary to get reelected in almost every case, and especially in the cases of, of, of uh, the leadership of the Republican Party over these last few years, trying to ride herd on Trump and then finally realizing if they want to get things, they're just going to have to go along with him. And then it gets too late after January 6th for them to walk away. They realize that he's got them. He owns the mega base that the people, uh, President Biden last week called the extremist mega base. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a little bit of that, Jim. I think also people like McConnell made deals and they thought, well, all I've got to do is pretend to be loyal. But of course, there, here they are now, they're legacy tarred with, uh, with what they let happen, especially as more and more of us 
uh, discover uh, what went on behind uh, behind closed doors with, between them and, and Trump. But you know, McConnell is arguably one of the most strategic men on the planet. And I watched Mona Charon in your film, who obviously is a conservative commentator, she worked for Ronald Reagan, saying all they had to do, particularly after their fine people on both sides after Charlottesville, that was the moment, band together. Don't stand up one by one by one. Mitch, she didn't mention Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell calls in 40 senators, 50 senators, whatever it is, and says, gentlemen and ladies, we're going to do this as one. Why did that never surface as a possibility for any of these guys and women? You, you mean why didn't they why didn't they do things to Why didn't they unionize and essentially yeah. do it as a group rather than as individuals, which they couldn't, the, they, weren't strong enough they, to do? Right, that's the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question about about w w w that I kept asking why why not just step up why not just do it well it, some of it is the hubris uh, uh, Mitch McConnell wanted a, a, a conservative uh, Supreme Court for right. the next generation um, and he thought I think he thought uh, he could manage yep. his relationship with Trump because he's he's. He's been so successful all the way through his career at doing exactly that. But nobody in the Republican Party that I can find has ever been able, was ever able to manage him, to understand him, to know that this guy invaded their party. He wasn't even a Republican. And he invaded their party and they couldn't stop him. And they really thought they could because they're kind of politicians and they thought they they thought they could do deals. Well, he wasn't about to deal with any of them, that's for sure, except uh, taking over and moving it the direction he's moved it in, which is now uh, uh, they're stuck. Uh, I can't see any of them walking away from yeah. it. And, and, uh, and that's part of the problem when you think, well, what's the nature of the impact of all of this on the democracy? Well, that's the impact. You know, let, let's talk about Trump himself for a minute. I, I, I would never have thought that I would praise a filmmaker for a two-minute opening that included Wendell Wilkie, the losing <laughs> candidate in 1944, I think. Could you just describe the first two minutes of this film, which are really electric? We were sitting around trying to finish the film, trying to think of a way to finish the film. And I got this bright idea that why don't we get everybody who's ever done the concession speech, even from the days when it was a telegram they sent, and they basically read the telegram. Let's get them all, everybody who we can find. And uh, 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 we, we, we dug out all the stock footage as far back as we could go, as far back as television goes, I think, and uh, laid them all out. And there they were in little bursts. And it was just fabulous. And first the argument was, well, we should start with Trump. And no, 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 we'll finish with Trump. Because after you see history laid out that way, and that nobody has ever done what Donald Trump did at 2.30 in the morning uh, or the night after the election, um, uh, it really makes, in a way, uh, the point about the entire film. Well, you know, it also, uh, it, it, as a student of your films, Michael Kirk, uh, when I'm watching that little Trump bite, saying I won, actually, uh, I hearken back to one of your great quadrennial features, The Choice, where you spend two hours on each candidate and you talk about the influence of uh, uh, Roy Cohn, people know from the McCarthy hearings, as lawyer for the Trump family when they come out, if I remember correctly, from a housing discrimination case that they were brutalized and lost in. He basically tells Trump, say we won, say we won relentlessly and never stop and people will believe us. And decades later, it's the lessons of Roy Cohn that Donald Trump is internalized on election night, the night he lost as you show in Iowa to Ted Cruz, all that stuff traces back to Cohn, no? That's absolutely right. And and uh, you and I may be the only people, who, and, and our editor and uh, <laughs> the other people on my team who remember all those strands and tentacles of things that Trump does, but uh, they're all there. They were all there. They were in plain sight, Jim, since uh, 2014, 2015, yeah. as he started to make the run. But we just never, we all believed, I think, um, that the pivot would happen 
and suddenly the power and the and the majesty give way to the responsibility when you're Donald Trump sitting in the Oval Office. But of course, as we know, that was not to be. You even go back as far as to say he thought the Emmys were rigged when The Apprentice lost <laughs> on best whatever reality show. You know, I want to change gears. You have uh, Jonathan Carl from ABC in your yeah. film. And I want to read a quote to you in Margaret Sullivan, the media critic in The Washington Post, final column the other day. Here's what Carl is quoted as saying. How do you cover a candidate who is effectively anti-democratic? How do you cover a candidate who is running both against whoever the Democratic candidate is, but also running against the very democratic system that makes all of this possible? What were you thinking about when making this film? And I'm guessing you're already thinking about how do I portray a Donald Trump if he runs for re-election in 2024 in the choice? How do you cover a man who is attempting to destroy the system that he's attempting to head? This way, the way we do in this film, uh, we try to tell the truth. You try to be, you try to be fair to the innocent, and uh, and uh, and um, and and point the finger at uh, the people who enabled and helped him, uh, and uh, and warrant from the very beginning that this that this man. I think the first words in the film are are, are about the lie that he told that night. I mean, this is a, there are some, there are some parts of some stories that there's just not another side on. And, uh, and I think uh, the relationship of Donald Trump to the truth and to democracy and to the constitution and to the guardrails and the norms that we thought we had, uh, uh, that, that story needed to be told. We've told uh, as much of it as we can from 30,000 feet. Uh, it's my fervent hope that not only will this film lay down as history for others, but it will it will spark uh, it will spark uh, uh, others to go forward in the same way uh, and and cover the parts of it we just couldn't cover or couldn't uncover. Well, I hope I hope that's all true. But we only have 45 seconds left. You regularly speak to Zinblatt and Levitsky, we've had on the show, who wrote that chilling book, How Democracies Die. And throughout your film, they uh, come in talking about historical precedent for exactly what strongman Trump is doing. So they seem to be saying, though maybe not as definitively as I'm now suggesting it, there will be one of those democracies that they are writing about if the embrace of Trump continues. Almost everyone we talked to, we interviewed 30 people for this film, almost everyone, and, and no Democrats, uh, and almost everyone in this film that we talked to is worried, desperately worried about uh, Trump candidacy and, and, and worried about even the midterms. But let's say they, let's say the midterms are a, a Republican sweep or at least an effective Republican mm -hmm. takedown. Um, plenty to worry about, Jim. Plenty to worry about in 2024. Well, you brilliantly... That's people we talked to. What's that? Sorry. And that's from the people we talked to. That's not even my opinion. I, I want to put my head under the pillow all the time. You know, it's uh, it's a scary time. Well, you watch the film, and I think you, people learn it's time to get your head out from under the pillow. And another yeah. spectacular piece of work by you and your colleagues. Michael, thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you.